Hello, adventurers. I want to take a moment to tell you that all our content can now be found uninterrupted and commercial-free on Apollo Plus. Apollo Plus is a subscription-based service that enhances your audio fiction experience with ad-free access to your favorite shows and exclusive content, while at the same time supporting us all as creators to keep bringing you quality content. Please take a moment to check out Apollo Plus at apollopods.com or download the app in your Google or Apple app stores. Again, that's Apollo Plus, your new home for quality audio fiction. <sighs> oh, hello, adventurers. Uh, welcome back. Mm. Can you smell the trees here in the forest? Feel that warm glow of the sun on our cheeks, despite the frost on the ground? Though we're far to the north now, away from the comforts of Garnet Keep, it's a beautiful day, to be sure. I, I want to thank our patrons for helping us get here, along with special mentions to Rory Christensen, Lainey Flanagan, Jolene Fresquez, Hilly Munoz, Daniel Nichols, and Brian Dowling. For this journey in particular, that all our supporters can be found in the show notes. We deeply thank you all. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is as good a spot as any. I, uh, do you mind helping me sit a bit? My, this armor really is digging into my shoulders. Ah. Uh, well, I'm going to sit here a moment and take in the trees, if you don't mind. Elaviv likes to remind me to stop and enjoy the little things. Life's short, after all. But if you hurry up ahead, you can still catch up to the team on their way to the Nether Spring. I have no desire to enter the skull of an ancient giant, after all. It just seems a bit too, well, creepy for this old knight. Anyways, I wish you and our friends the best in the adventure, and hope it continues to be as uneventful as this beautiful day. But... Uh, something tells me I'll be proven wrong yet again. Dawn of Dragons, Season 5, Episode 3, The Tomb of Shadow. Should be there shortly. I think I see the top of the skull just past the tree line. Shimi, what do you think? Yes, I see it too. Toby, run ahead, boy. The short form of the jackal grunted in obedience as it ran up the path ahead, looking for any potential threats to the traveling group. Vash's cropped dark beard and the hood of his cloak framed his face below dark eyes that searched the distance. He wore dark green and brown leather that helped him to blend in the northern forest of the Whispering Woods. The suede of his tall moccasins creaked as they pressed carefully forward. To his right was the almond-eyed and bronze-toned Shimi, a quiet beastmaster from the foothills of Troll, who had come to Garnet Keep following the battle with Nightblade's undead army. Offering to help in the kitchen was his traveling companion, the young and mysterious dark elf Lily. Vash could still hear her words, as could a hooded figure who walked silently behind them. She told me to take this to you. Even now, she reaches out to you, Zoran. The sword does. I... How can... I'm not proud. My people had stole this. She told me from her resting place. The elves of Iridian forged the rapier following the war of the stone. It was a god slayer, they claimed, holding some secret, powerful source. And they named it... The Final Word. Several paces behind the two scouts, walking with less cautious steps, were the familiar and heavily armored Benedict, Sophie, and cloaked Zorin, who was passing the bare sword hilt between his hands. He marveled at how familiar it still was, past the ancient rust and tarnish now clinging to it. To an untrained eye, it appeared like a broken weapon. Useless junk of the past. But Zorin knew better. (sighs) 
That's pretty grim. Wow. Zorin's heart felt heavy suddenly as he made out the mossy stairway winding up to the mouth of a giant skull. This is the room we were in. And over here in the sarcoph... Sar... 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 <laughs> Sarcophagus. Yes, uh, th- that. That's where we found these staves. Benedict smelled the dust in the room, which was surprisingly sparse given the time that had passed. It was probably cleaned, but he sensed no evil from it. In fact, he sensed no good from it either. Zorin, it's been two months since you sent that expedition up here, correct? Yeah. Over, actually. But I see no trace of them. Yeah, Scott Mir and I couldn't find anything of them either. But there has to be more than just this room. Zorin gently felt the sandstone walls with his fingertips as he walked toward the dais in the center of the room. I agree. Hey, uh, Benedict, come here real quick. Yes? What is it? Look there. See that slit there in the center? It's only a couple inches. Yes. And it looks like there's circular markings around it. Exactly. A perfect circle, in fact. That would be... A keyhole! But what key would be used? I'm going to try and make one. (laughs) Oh, of course you would. But first, can you drive your sword into it and try to turn it? Sure. It wouldn't be that simple, would it? As Zorin half hoped and half expected, the sword turned in the hole 90 degrees to rest horizontally, and the floor of the stone box slid slowly to the right. The surprised Benedict jumped out of the stone sarcophagus, wide-eyed as he pulled his sword Kettlebane free, allowing the portal to open completely. Zorin smiled back at him mischievously, reminding him of the looks Zane and Zorin would give him when they were getting ready to do something questionable. You know you want to go first. You don't have to. I'm going. Shimi, Scottmere, help me find some more rope for this. Yes. Wait. Any idea how deep that is? I can't see the bottom. Yeah. Um, one sec. Uh, Ah, here. He found a blackened tin plate. He supposed it was for a lantern originally, but now served to be home for the waxy white remnants of a once tall candle. He held it over the dark abyss and lit it. Wait! But he was too late. They all froze silently as Zorin let go. It extinguished itself almost immediately from the fall. But several seconds later, it could be heard as it clattered faintly in the dark distance. Benedict shot a look at the grinning Zorin. Hmm. 200 feet, I'd guess. Zorin, we don't know what, or better yet, who is down there. Come on, the giant skylight up here that we made by opening the door was plenty enough, I'm sure, Benedict. Trust me. If something down there wants us, they already know we're here. We'll need to get more rope at the campsite. If you and Vash could do that and just guard our exit, I can get us down there. Cannonball! Just kidding. I'm gonna wait up here and watch our backs. I'm not a super big fan of going back into the darkness. Yeah, and let me know if you find a man offering bad decisions again. Loved that too. (laughs) <laughs> Cordelia smiled at the light-hearted jest and then nodded at Dabria, who stepped forward to stand on the edge of the sarcophagus. She motioned to the others to join her as she drew her whip and held it out toward Cordelia in a coil within her palm. Cordelia passed a hand over it and it began to illuminate like a torch. Dabria then offered a hand to Cordelia, 
helping her up onto the edge as well as with Benedict and Zorin. Hold on. Dante Mare. Cordelia spoke softly as she took a step out into the black void below and began floating softly downward. She gently pulled Dabri as Zorin and Benedict to join her in the slow descent. Slowly, they descended into the inky shadows. The only indicator of their descent was the shrinking rectangle of light above. Benedict saw Dabri's face illuminated from the whip's makeshift torchlight. A halo danced across her short cropped blonde hair. Look at that! Below her black buckled boots and ivory pants, a crimson and sapphire dragon head of carved stone spiraled out of the darkness. Cordelia guided them around it, gently circling like a leaf on a calm day. Zoran stared at it in deep thought, feeling a warmth in his chest as his pulse quickened with a slow drift into the unknown. The room was massive, and he believed that he could make out another identical pillar 20 feet or so away from the globe of light that surrounded them. As they circled and his eyes adjusted, he noticed there were possibly four of them at regular intervals, and he suspected they continued on past as well. Reminding him of the old mine of their childhood, he thought more and began to second-guess himself. Was it that memory, actually, or another? A shape seemed to move in the darkness. Hey, hey, did anyone else see that? See what? Something just moved down there. I didn't see it. But... I don't think you were wrong. The ground began to illuminate as they descended the final four feet. Bedick watched his black boots slowly make contact with the glossy, polished flagstone floor. It seemed glassy, almost like it was wet or varnished, free of any dirt or dust to indicate its age in these depths below the room they just exited. Heavy chain and plate returned its weight to sit upon his shoulders. Zorn stepped back to feel the cold blackness behind them as he pulled his cloak over his dark hair. We aren't alone down here. Get back! The darkness formed just outside the circle of light in a gaping maw of a dragon made of misty black smoke. Move! Ah! Woody and Zorn found themselves enveloped in a cold mist the color of blue-black ink suspended in water. Zorn! Uh, uh, it, it burns. Hold on! Cordelia felt the right side of her face and neck grow numb from the slow burn and ache like exposure to the cold. Zoran's eyes grew wide as he looked at Cordelia's face. He drew her close under her arms, her corset lacing, raking his arms as he pulled her behind a pillar. No! Yeah! Benedict and Dabria struck into the darkness. The glow of Dabria's whip caused the 20-foot-high black form to retreat back into its familiar shadows along with the edge of the great sword of Benedict's bloodline. Shrieking, its eyes rolled like black, pearlescent fluids and dark bottles, illuminated briefly in the light. The light! We need more light! Night Lord, illuminate this room a perpetual night with a glorious day! Solaria! Writhed in pain as it shrank away from Benedict and Dabria, where the light was originating, blinding the room and bathing it in its warmth. Screaming, the mists forming the dragon unraveled like thick smoke and a gentle breeze. Until it was gone. Benedict! He turned to Zorin, and seeing Cordelia's limp form on the ground, ran to her with Dabria. Her face was blackened and looked rotten. One eye now was a yellow-gray orb, vacant and useless. Zorn was breathing heavily, his chest heaving as the blackened skin crept over his exposed hands. Hold on. (sighs) Hurts. Night Lord, grant them the strength to push back this blight. Wow. 
Okay, give me a minute here. Uh, thank you. What was... That was some echo of a dragon. Not, not a real dragon. One constructed of spell work. The creature of dark mages, I would imagine. Here, let me help you up. Dabria pulled Cordelia up from the floor and pushed her black hair away from her now unblemished face and green eyes. There you are now. No worse for wear. Th- thanks. And thank you, Bendix. The room was as wide as it was tall. 200 feet in any direction. Looking like the arenas back in Ellington but underground. As they explored the now empty cube, they found two doors on either side of the room, dark blue and deep red, heavy and banded in cold forged iron. These are cold iron bands. Dabria, that, that dragon wasn't just magic, was it? No, I don't believe so. The Shattered Lands lie on the other side of this nether spring, and if rumors are to be believed, there are more powerful forces of chaos at work. Like what? Benedict, remember the fairy tales about Viridian being elves and pixies and all that? Yes, and locked to not allow mortals to pass. Of course I remember that, but what is this all about? Mischief is one thing. But what if they are twisted into a living nightmare? The legend that Dabria and I are referring to is that the Shattered Lands are supposedly the dark reflection of Viridian's enchanted forests. Wait. Oh. <laughs> Ruled by the Shadow Fae. episode. Benedict the Paladin, Brian Dowling, Cordelia the Fire Mage, Jolene Fresquez, Dabria the Death Cleric, J.D. Rose, Shimi the Beastmaster, Jessica Atchley, Scottmere the Dwarven Berserker, Colton Jansen, Sophie the Swordmaster, Sarah Jenkins, Vash the Archer, Barrett Giant, Zorin, the swashbuckler, Cody Miller, and Keldor, the narrator, Mike Ashley. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Dice Tower Theater's Dawn of Dragons. Please join us in thanking our magnificent cast for their performance, and their full list can be found in the show notes. If you'd like a sticker from the show, please leave a review on any podcasting platform and send a screenshot to dm at dicetowertheater.com with a mailing address we can send it to. In the next episode, who is or who are the unexpected visitors to this remote temple? And are they friend or foe? Until then, fellow adventurers, stay safe and remember the oath.